Ok, boa tarde a todos. Ok, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome all of the participants uh, to our sixth symposium, ok? International Symposium on Schistosomiasis, ok? Next year, we're going to have the 16th edition of the International Symposium on Schistosomiasis that is going to take place in November in Ouro Preto, in Brazil, in the state of Minas Gerais, okay? And today, we are going to have the sixth pre-symposium so that we can discuss topics that are extremely important in the research, mainly when it comes to translational research and schistosomiasis. So on behalf of our vice president, Mr. Rodrigo Correia de Oliveira, I would like to welcome uh, all of the participants and our network, our program, our translational research program is a very important program for the vice presidency of Fiocruz, okay? Uh, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, which uh, takes place in Rio de Janeiro. And so the translational research program aims to identify problems and difficulties uh, when it comes to scientific matters, scientific problems, diagnostics, uh, applying the treatment to our patients, critical issues that are very, very important so that we can fight against the, the well, the, the, the disease, schistosomiasis becoming even more serious. And so the possible tools to control this disease, we have the treatment mainly of children and young people. And Prazi, Prazi Quantel has been studied for quite some time, and we're trying to minimize the negative aspects of the treatment with Prazi Quantel. And mainly, we are trying to develop a pediatric uh, formula for Prazi Quantel. And this is a very, very interesting topic that we're going to discuss during this pre symposium. Without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to Dr. Ricardo Lissio, and he's give us an introduction about the topic and introduce the, the panelists. And also, Dr. Ricardo Lissio, I would like to pass the floor to you, and I would like to wish to all of you a very successful event and lots and lots of learning during this symposium, well, print symposium. Thank you, Dr. Wim. Thank you so much from the support that you always give us from the vice presidency to foster these discussions about schistosomiasis. Welcome to the pre-symposium event of the 16th International Symposium on Schistosomiasis. Essa introdução eu vou falar em português, então a gente uh, estamos com tradução simultânea, Sim. depois eu vou tentar... So I'm going to start in Portuguese, because we have simultaneous translation, and afterwards I'm going to speak English. Welcome to the pre-symposium of the 16th International Symposium on Schistosomiasis. Uh, before we start, I'm going to share some pieces of information with you. Dr. Otavio Pierre, who was going to be the moderator today, unfortunately could not be here today, so I'm here uh, trying to substitute him. And this is going to be a difficult task because he's a benchmark, not only as a scientist, but also as a human being, okay? And I was uh, flattered to be chosen to substitute to Dr. Otavio. And I would like to use this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Otavio on his publication to celebrate the International Cystosomiasis Day, okay? Now, going back a little bit to our event today, our pre-symposium, I would like to emphasize that this event is being uh, broadcast on YouTube in English and in Portuguese, okay? So uh, we this event is going to be in English, but we are going to offer simultaneous translation into Portuguese. So I would like to thank the general coordination of zoonosis surveillance from the Ministry of Health because they have constantly supported our event and offered the simultaneous translation for us. So thank you. Going back to English. 
Due to the COVID pandemic, uh, the 16th International Symposium on Chistosal Mises has been postponed to uh, 2022. But to keep the scientific discussion in the field of Chistosal Mises alive, we are prompting these pre-symposium events uh, that take place every two months. We have had already five sessions of this event, and the links of the previous sessions are available on the Chistosal Mises Translational Program website. Uh, the following events are being publicized in several channels. If you still don't follow us, I suggest you to do so. And I'm very pleased to moderate the, the last session, uh, pre-symposium, where we will address the topic of schistosomized treatment, focusing on application of new pediatric treatment option to study the schistosomized in Africa. We have today the distinguished participation of you, Dr. Yuta Henrod Rupp, Dr. Okba Hadjali, and Dr. Daniel Lacerda de Oliveira. Just to introduce you the, the dynamic of this session, this session, we will hear from the three speakers and at the end of all presentations, we will have a time for questions. At any time, you can post your question in the chat at YouTube. Uh, our team will identify the questions that will be answered by the speakers at the end of the presentation. So if you want, you can write your question in Portuguese and we translate it. So moving forward to our first presentation, our first speaker will be Dr. Yuta Hyrad Rupp. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce correctly your name. So Dr. Yuta is the head of the Global Health Institute at Merck based in Switzerland. Her focus is the discovery and develop, uh, development of innovative healthcare solutions, including drugs, diagnostics, and technology platforms for most vulnerable population, such as children and their mothers in developing countries. Uh, the disease focus of the Institute in, is on schistosomiasis in, in malaria. And Yuta received her PhD at the Max Planck Institute and after the, her postdoctoral training, she joined the biopharmaceutical industry in, in various assignments. Uh, she has been part of the Pediatric Project Control Consortium since its inception in, in 12, uh, 2012, and chair of the consortium board since uh, 2017. She also serves as scientific, scientific advisory uh, at, at various advisory boards. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yuta, to, for accepting our invitation, and uh, feel free to, to share your, your screen. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ricardo. And I'm sharing my screen. Now this is intro, share. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can see it. So it should go into full full screen. Voila. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks also to the organizers for um, for this opportunity uh, to give a bit of background and introduction to what our consortium, the Pediatric Praziquantel Consortium, has achieved over the past years. And uh, today I'm here in, in my role as the chair of this Pediatric uh, Praziquantel Consortium Board. And I would say there is quite a history and a journey to success. And um, what is extremely important to state from the beginning is the important role um, that Famanginos uh, has played and is still playing in, in this consortium. Um, I'm probably talking uh, to the experts, so no need to explain what is schistosomiasis about. Um, still, it is the second most devastating tropical disease um, in Africa. But we, of course, know that it's still existing in, in Brazil. 240 million people worldwide suffer from this disease. And as I said, more than 90% are, are, um, are in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the cycle of transmission, it is a disease caused by worms and 
This goes through contaminated stagnant water that when you are in contact with this water, unfortunately, the infection rate is especially high among children. We have chronic symptoms of this disease that result in learning disabilities, anemia and malnutrition. Um, and, and also what we see that chronic diseases can be some like liver fibrosis, genital schistosomiasis, and even bladder cancer. So that's the disease. It is neglected because it's a disease of poor people, and um, it's a disease of neglected people. Now, 10 years ago, when we, when we looked into what, what can we do to eliminate, and this is mainly driven by WHO and the, the roadmap um, for neglected tropical diseases. So when we looked into the disease, into schistosomiasis, there was one population that was completely left untreated. These are young children, young, younger than six years of, of age. Um, so the prevalence that was debatable, whether there is a high prevalence, we know the prevalence is very high in older children. We, we, we saw a medical need and we saw that this age group, if left untreated, will always contribute to the transmission of the disease. So elimination will not be achievable if not everybody including preschool age children uh, would be treated. We have a treatment. We have a treatment that we use globally, which is uh, Braziquantel. I know Brazil also uses uh, Oxamniquine, but Braziquantel is, is used um, globally because it is very efficacious against mansunai and hematobium and, and other uh, schistospecies, schistosoma species. But praziquantel comes with the disadvantage that it's uh, a bigger tablet. We do not have a pediatric medication. So that was the clear unmet medical needs. And it was also clearly stated uh, by Ottavio Pieri, whom I know since really the beginning of, um, of this journey. So as a consortium, when we started in 2012, we had the following vision. It's to reduce the global disease burden of schistosomiasis by addressing the medical need of infected preschool age children, including infants and toddlers. So this means really young children. Our mission is to develop, register, and provide access to a pediatric praziquantel formulation to treat these young children. And this is important to, to keep in mind, develop, register, and provide access. Um, Brazil, of course, is, is different uh, with, with the health system. In many, many African countries, providing access is not an easy task. So what did we do when we started in 2012? There was no partnership on schistosomiasis. So I think we were the first international public-private partnership for this disease. So we created this consortium as a nonprofit um, PPP, public-private partnership. And um, we started with, with four partners in 2012. I think Pamanginho joined us very quickly in 2013. We have a governance, we have a consortium board that I'm, I'm leading. We have a development team, an access team, and also several other sub-teams. We are supported by international experts and funders. That's very important because such a development comes at certain costs. 
And we have WHO, the World Health Organization, as an observer. So today, today we are more than 13, 14 collaborators in, in this consortium. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger. We have other countries than Brazil joining. We have ministries of health from Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya and Uganda joining us. Um, and the support, the financial support comes from Merck, from um, GHIT, the Japanese Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, and EDCTP, which is a European um, platform, European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. So these external funders, GHIT and EDCTP, are absolutely important and supportive and are joining consortium team meetings and the consortium board um, because I think we as a partnership, we are very transparent in, in what we are doing. So what's, what are our goals? As I mentioned in our mission, develop and register. So we, we really looked into a target product profile. What is needed for these young children? What are suitable pediatric formulations? And there have been attempts before we came up with our consortium. There was a, a liquid, a prasequential um, liquid solution already uh, available. Um, we, we also know from other diseases, from other uh, treatments, uh, how a pediatric formulation could look like. So we invited, for this question, we invited countries, key opinion leaders, and WHO to give guidance. And I, I remember for each of these expert meetings on, on various topics, target product profile, clinical development, regulatory path, um, we always had the participation from Brazil. And that was very important and still is very important uh, because at the end, um, your country will benefit uh, from, from this development. And our partnership um, is very much dependent on, on the success of uh, the contribution of Famanginos. So with the development and launch, we made great progress over the past years. And you will hear today key results from our clinical phase three. The step for the future is to provide access. So to provide the access to this new treatment to sustainable mechanisms. And here again, we have launched a, a program called ADOPT. ADOPT is about integrating the access into a plan with countries that are already now uh, participating and that are interested in how to implement um, this medication in their country policies. And that might be different from country to country. One important aspect in our project is that we, in addition to Farmanginios, who is manufacturing uh, the product, um, we also gave voluntary licensing to African manufacturers because the number of patients, especially in Africa, is huge. Um, the most recent number we received from WHO is that we may talk about 50, 50 million young children um, that are in need of, um, of this pediatric prasequantel treatment. To be clear, the treatment for the patients remains for free, also in Africa. The challenge is how do we provide and how do we procure the product? Because the local manufacturer also needs to get reimbursed and someone has to pay for, for the product. So we are currently in the process of activating organizations that are interested in this 
um, in this medication and that would be interested to take the medication on board, including not only organizations, but also countries that would, uh, would be able to buy at least partly um, by this, this new formulation. So what is it well, that we are developing and that we are talking about? Um, the formulation we have now in hands is a so-called ODT, an orally dispersible tablet. Um, the chemists in the audience may know that praziquantel is a racemic mixture of two enantiomers. Um, we, have to we have decided to work with one enantiomer, the r praziquantel which is the active enantiomer. So our tablets today, you see it here um, uh, on the, on, in this photo, is small, much smaller than the current tablet. You can be much more precise with the dosing because you also deal with small children. It's, uh, the tablet is orally dispersible, it can be taken with or without water. And the experts among the audience may know that praziquantel is bitter, and we were able to, to reduce the bitterness. The tablets are stable in hot and humid conditions of tropical regions. And as I already mentioned, we are transferring the manufacturing process for local production also to, to Africa. So what is important and what have we achieved all together as a consortium? And again, I want to, to emphasize how important such a partnership is because none of us uh, even a big pharmaceutical company, none of us would have been able um, to, do, to develop uh, this product on its own. Um, and by working as partners, we were also able to build local capacity that strengthens the, the infrastructure in the countries. So the two countries we were focusing on for clinical development where um, Ivory Coast and, uh, and Kenya. Um, so here we, we definitely uh, built infrastructure for clinical sites. We trained local healthcare professionals. And um, this capacity strengthening also takes place on the manufacturing side. So the process development and manufacturing where processes are transferred to local expert. And again, let me mention Farmanginios because you play a great role here in, um, in this tech transfer as well. Uh, the first local manufacturer in um, Africa is Universal Corporation, and they are based in Nairobi in Kenya. And they are set up for really large scale production. And I'm coming here already to an end because I really would like to give the floor to uh, my colleagues. Daniel will, will come next, and then Okpa, um, my colleague from my company, will guide you through the very interesting and exciting um, phase three clinical results. Thank you very much for your attention, and I stop sharing and hand back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Jutta. Thank you very much. It was really nice to to hear about the, the consortium and to know a little bit more about the consortium. Thank you for sharing us. Uh, let's move. Uh, so if you have just joined us, uh, as I said at the beginning of the event, we will leave the questions for the end of the presentations. Uh, but you can write your questions at the, the, the YouTube chat at any time you want. So our next guest, uh, I have a pleasure to call uh, Dr. Daniel Lacerda de Oliveira. Uh, Dr. Daniel joined the Pharma Guinness in 2006 and is current uh, project manager in research and development, manage both technical and operational teams. Uh, 
uh, prior to that, uh, he was uh, head of the laboratory of pharmaceutical technology and specialist in development of drug formulation, uh, working since 2001 in various departments in pharmaceutical industry. He has extensive knowledge of pharmaceutical legislation uh, involving registration, post registration, chains, and GMP. So uh, thank you, Daniel, for accepting our, our invitation. Uh, you can now share your screen and you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you all. Thank you, Yuta. Let me... Yeah. Well. Ok, uh, muito obrigado. Eu vou, eu vou pedir desculpa, mas Thank you very much. I, I apologize. I'll make my presentation in Portuguese. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear fine. Please feel at ease to speak in Portuguese. We have simultaneous interpretation today. Well, I'll start my presentation then. The, my objective today is to present the development process and manufacturing process of this pediatric formulation of Praziquantel, of this uh, oral dispersive uh, tablet developed by the consortium in partnership with Farmanguinhos, Mer Merck and all the partners. Farmanguinhos is part of the consortium. Well, I always like to start by showing the structure of this consortium. I know in some slides I'll repeat a bit what Yuta has mentioned, but with the intention of going a bit deeper in the technical side and to show you the history of this historical project of the development of this formulation. This first slide represents the joint effort we carried out to develop this formulation since 2012 when this consortium has been established. And so far, as we have had a very satisfactory result of phase three studies and going now towards the registration and future launch of the project. As Yuta has mentioned, I always like to show in the beginning where the product comes from. Well, first, start with a uh, active uh, ingredient, Praziquantel, which is the, this is used for exosomosis, uh, for systemiasis, since 1982, when uh, Praziquantel has been developed, the uh, movement of American buyer, and then registered for human use. As Yuta has mentioned, and the chemists know quite well, Praziquantel, it is a racinic uh, mixture. And as such, they they have one to one, one uh, geometry, and R, Praziquantel, and S, Praziquantel, this is a chemical uh, denomination. Or, as it is usually known, the, the optical denomination, which is level Praziquantel and Dexto Praziquantel, which is an optic the, for those chemical isomers. The consortium then, it, it is common knowledge that level Praziquantel and R Praziquantel is, it was in literature, it already showed that this would be the active ingredient responsible for the schistosomy side. Uh, well, actually, an, an indication that would have less bitterness, which is an issue, especially for pediatric uh, posology. So it was decided to develop a new formulation, have L Praziquantel and R Praziquantel. And here I put R Praziquantel, this name, you start seeing more as you think R is the pronunciation of R uh, in English. The WHO has approved as chemical, common chemical name, the 
our Brazil Contel denomination. So probably in the future, our documentation of the consortium will be changed and we will name the product as our Brazil Contel. In my presentation, you'll see the the level Brazil Contel denomination, which is not wrong. It, it does identify the product, ultimately. And why or dispersible tablet? Why so? Well, in the beginning of the project, the consortium had a panel of experts and have discussed the need of a formulation, or especially a pediatric one, and the objective of uh, was preschool for preschool children. And when you go into the literature, we find a, a paper from, it's not a consensus, but, in the, but it indicates, and I show in this picture, in this table, some suggestions of a pharmaceutical form of choice when you have children from one, from one month to two years of age and two to five as well. Obviously, the first pharmaceutical form of choice is an emotion, is a solution, uh, a fervescent tablet that it generates the solution because a child at that moment, they, it's easier to administer. You know that, every, well, if you have a child that age, you know how easy it is to administer that liquid form. Yet, we can see the suggestion table of EMA. There are other pharmaceutical forms that can be acceptable, such as the oral dispersible tablets, as indicated in the penultimate uh, line row. For children from two to five, it may be acceptable. So, and some dispersible tablets that at the end will generate solutions that will be administered to children. From that on, we assess what is more feasible feasible to be developed. And the WHO has fostered the development of formulations that are economically, well, they are feasible nonetheless, to the distribution in the African continent, the lower income countries. And uh, when we compare solid formulations to, uh, versus liquid ones, we see some criteria that we consider, well, depend on the point of view and the technology used, we see that may be a difference of opinion, but the most important thing is, is when you see the, the the logistics and storage costs and the risk of stability in liquid formulation. So, so when you start developing this pharmaceutical form in larger scale, in the economic part, and WHO already recommends and requests to be specific or dispersible tablet because this facilitates, reduces costs and uh, facilitates logistics for distribution. Well, the product, the drug, well, the consortium, it has started this project, although the initial focus would be uh, innovative with R, because it can tell, to reduce the risk at the end of not having a product because the most important thing would be to to have the product to administer to children you know the rock quasi quantel president quantel it was efficient the consortium decided to develop two parallel formulations and they have been developed up, up to phase two of the project so those two formulations rock quasi quantel and l plus the Quantel, were uh, developed to be or dispersible tablets of 150 milligrams and have reached several targets, several important goals. Well, the first of them was the two, both formulations, they were confirmed to be less bitter than the, the commercial race mate. And 
in this would be an amazing gain on acceptability of products by children. In a, the manufacturing process, an easy manufacturing standard process, because it's very easy for, for this type of drug to have a lower cost. So it was not only to look for more advanced technologies and generate a project with a higher cost, it would uh, not facilitate the access of the population to this product. For that reason, the, the consortium decided to work along the lines of a process development. Here represented this a standard process of uh, the, uh, the human uh, mixture. And, uh, well, a simple process there would be, well, besides the lower cost, would have the, the ease of disseminating it to African uh, manufacturing sites and in the endemic countries to try and fight this disease. And the other important objective would be for it to be stable in highly humid areas because Schistosomosis is characteristic of uh, for tropical countries, and we reach this objective. And here, well, those countries they are classified in the four B area, so that's why we need to have stability studies, both accelerated as well as long term. For forty degrees Celsius and seventy five percent of humidity rate for six months, and both products. And the final product, it has reached satisfactory results in the long-term stability in a temperature of uh, above 30 degrees Celsius and 75% of humidity rate with results that are satisfactory for 24 months. So we have the forecast of taking those studies beyond the 24 months. I believe we are, we have sample in the stability chamber up to five years as far as I'm concerned. And for initial registration, you would allow this shelf life, but we must follow it. But in the 24 month results are satisfactory and, and there's a good indication of 36 months with satisfactory results already. And, and we are uh, having a, we are registering uh, in the future in the regulatory agencies. So the tablets, they should be easily, easy to digest, okay, or to swallow. They should be easy to swallow, mainly for children, and they should be taken with or without water. So if they are oral dispersible, then it's easier. So I have a photo comparing the size of the, the tablets, okay, from Farmanguinhos, Biltricide, which is the benchmark medication according to the WHO. Okay, the Praziquatel of 600 milligrams, and this is meeting the demands of the schistosomiasis program in Brazil. And the LPZQ, okay, of 150 milligrams, you can see that is way smaller, way smaller, okay, in a way that makes the uh, it easier to swallow and obviously obviously something that you can notice it's not one fourth of the benchmark medication or the one from pharma use but 150 milligrams okay it's not because since we need we need to develop a formulation formulation that has a flavor that is going to be able to disguise the praziquatel uh, flavor, because even though it can be less bitter, it is still bitter. And so you need technology, you need incipients, you need input to mask or disguise this bitterness of the original uh, praziquatel. But we have already reduced it uh, significantly and this makes it easier to uh, give it to a child when they need to take it directly in their mouth or when it is an oil. And so I believe that the most important of the product is that it is also dispersible in water. You can see the short video there. 
Uh, so five uh, tablets being uh, dispersed in water. And so this is less than a, a teaspoon. Okay, so five ODTs in 10 milliliters of water. And so the administration is way easier for the children who cannot uh, swallow or take the, the medication directly in their mouths. Okay, they transform the tablets into a suspension. In the end, you're gonna see that it's gonna become a suspension and then uh, you can administer the medication way easier. Okay, so so the butricide and the famagus one, you don't have to, to grind them, okay, to give it to the water in order for you to disperse them into the water. So it's going to take a long, long time for it to disperse in water, the traditional uh, tablets, okay? But if you have a dosage equivalent to five tablets, you're going to have to fraction the tablet. And it's difficult, difficult, okay? Uh, commercially speaking. And you may also lose the mass of the tablet and then you can give a, a lower dose to the child, okay? And if you use this, you can use the, the, the tablets, you can use a small amount of water, five ODTs in 10 milliliters of water. And in one minute and a half, they are totally, uh, totally suspended in the water. And so for oral dispersible tablets, we can have uh, at least three minutes uh, for it to uh, disperse totally, a maximum of three minutes, and we have way lower than that. So explaining a little bit from the history of this development, okay? I like to show this and every year I come back to this. So in 2012, that's when the consortium, well, we started discussing the consortium. We discussed the development of the product. We started with Merck developing the LPZQ, uh, PZQ API. And then Astellas is one of the partners of the consortium. And they created the first formulations, the initial formulations of Haki Praziquantel and also L Praziquantel. Uh, and then we were still doing this in a lab, okay? Uh, we created a prototype and we transferred this uh, development to Merck that optimized the formulation, okay? Optimized the, the formulation of L Praziquantel so that they could they could produce the first batches and start the phase one clinical trial. And then we had the HAC Pranziquantel, the formulation of HAC Pranziquantel, because we were joining the consortium. Since we already worked with Pranziquantel, uh, uh, we, MEC only had a little bit, okay, of the product, so they had to work with a small scale. So uh, transfer the HAC Pranziquantel to Manguinhos, and then uh, El Pranziquantel to uh, MEC. And then it, it was going to be transferred to Far Manguinhos. And then the products entered phase one. And then at the same time, Merck continued developing and the optimization of, okay, uh, adaptations and the optimization of roots and processes and GMP manufacturing, okay? Because you don't find factories of inputs, okay, that produce the L Praziquantel, okay, only the Haki Praziquantel. So it was very important to develop this process so that we could have the product to distribute it in the future. So the two products, okay, Haki Praziquantel, uh, they went to the phase one, and El Praziquantel, okay? And we developed a formulation that tasted a little better. After that, in pre-DP2, the consortium decided to enter the phase two to start the phase two clinical trials, okay? And the consortium decided to have the two formulations uh, after phase one and entering phase two. And we started the study, Farmanguinhos continued 
with an optimization of the formulations and tests with suppliers, suppliers of uh, inputs. Merck did the same thing. They improved the formulation. And after phase two, when so the consortium decided, well, we have enough results, enough outcomes that are satisfactory so that we can continue only with L Brasil We had already started the transfer from Merck to Farmanguinhos, okay, regarding the formulation of Brasil and then we continued this process. In this transfer, transfer of the LPZQ, okay, it was very important because we started scaling up, scaling up the manufacturing process. And so when we went from one kilogram to two kilograms to 50 kilograms to 100 kilo kilograms uh, uh, regarding the production inside Farmanguinhos, we have faced many, many challenges uh, regarding the formulation. We needed to carry out some uh, process adjustments so that we had the final product uh, uh, totally ready for the registration. We started this in the middle of 2017, and until today, we are now concluding this work, okay? And during this period of time, we had two important, uh, two important uh, milestones. We had two clinical batches that were produced and they were sent to be part of clinical trials in a cold divery. And so we have the final results of the phase three clinical trials. And we decided to continue with the registration, to continue with the registration. And I believe that in 2022, we are going to conclude this technological phase with the manufacturing of the uh, PPQ batches, okay? And later on, we are going to submit this to our regulatory agency that is called Avisa. And there is a gap between the EMA and Avisa because of the differences among some of the prerequisites, okay? And for EMA, we can uh, submit it first, and we're going to need some answers from EMA so that we can define certain things with Avisa. But I believe that a gap is going to be no longer than six months, okay? And then we're going to have more details regarding this. And just to complement, because I cannot forget to mention this, throughout all of this process during all of these years, Merck, continued continued improving the the continue uh, well continued having a continuous improvement and scale up of the process to optimize and reduce the cogs and so the active ingredient is uh, represents a large uh, percentage of the the formulation of the product and so since it is expensive it is uh, the active ingredient it what makes the product more expensive so merck selected a company in china a company in china that is going to produce the active ingredient and they are always optimizing the process to reduce and reduce the cost okay okay they have already manufactured and released the ppq batches and after next year, uh, we're going to start manufacturing them at Farmanguinhos. At Juta mentioned, the consortium already had the intention of having a second manufacturing site in Africa, even to give autonomy to the continent, to have a larger scale of production. And Murky and Famanguinhos and the consortium, they searched and selected a second production site in, in Africa. And we have already started transferring the technology, okay? Trying to include in the first registration package at Eman, but this is not 100% uh, right yet. And to wrap up my presentation, I'm going to discuss the access and delivery of the drug product, okay? 
So nowadays, I believe that the drug is going to be approved by the end of 2023 to be launched in 2024. Pharma Games will be responsible for the manufacturing of the drug product to supply it in the endemic countries in Africa for the first years. And the volume is going to be accepted, acceptable for our structures. We don't only have other priorities, but some demands from the Ministry of Health and that have a huge demand and are going to compete with this DP. And we also are going to supply to the ADOPT implementation program in Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire and Uganda. And obviously for the Brazilian schistosomiasis program. So we are going to be the marketing authorization holder. We're going to be the main holders of the product in Brazil. We have already started a discussion with the vice presidency of Fio Cruz. Well, at the end of 2019, we started a discussion. And then in 2020, we had the pandemic and this was a little delayed, but we have started this discussion again of maybe uh, uh, implementing a clinical trial in Brazil because we know uh, what the scientific community has been asking from us and that we need a clinical trial being implemented in Brazil. And so regardless of a visa has already told us that, she, uh, that they are going to accept the clinical trials that were carried out in Africa. So we started uh, the clinical platform with the vice presidency and we're going to have this initial proposal. We're going to take it to the consortium because we're still having our internal discussions and uh, we're going to discuss this with a certain agents and stakeholders here in Brazil, the Ministry of Health and other uh, stakeholders that can implement and help us carry out this clinical trial. And the second manufacturer uh, site in Africa because they're going to have to cover a, a huge future demand that they have in Africa. And the consortium must be able to meet these demands and also to implement or achieve its mission, achieve its mission. So it's important to have the second manufacturing site. And we're not going to be stuck. We can identify other manufacturing sites, maybe transfer the, the drug product, okay? But uh, we haven't concluded this with a consortium. So that's it. And so this is a funding statement. So it's important to mention our supporters, our sponsors, okay? Without them, we would never have been able to reach uh, well, arrive at the place where we are. And these are all of the consortium partners. Thank you, Daniel. Your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me? Uh, well, I see. Okay. So thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, so if you have just uh, joined us, as I said at the beginning of the event, we will leave the questions for the end of the presentations, but you can write your question at the chat at any time you want, okay? So Daniel, we are gonna move forward for the next presentation, for the next speaker. Uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our third speaker, that is Dr. Okba Hadjali. Uh, Dr. Okba is a medical doctor with a board certification in clinical uh, pharmacology. His focus is in the clinical development of new drugs in infectious diseases for adults and pediatric populations uh, in developing countries. And he, to he holds extensive experience in clinical development, regulatory and academic settings. During the last 10 years, he has been involved across different projects in hepatitis uh, C, 
uh, HIV, multi drug resistance, tuberculosis, stogeloidizes, soil transmitted helminthesis, schistosomiasis, and malaria. And Dr. Ba joined the Merck in 2019 and is based in Madrid, Spain. So, Dr. Okba, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, feel free to share your, your screen. Thank you, Ricardo. Ricardo. So, allow me to share my screen. Just let me know if you can see it, please. Okay. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank you on behalf of the consortium for the opportunity to present the positive pivotal study result of our presequentel that is intended to cover two indications, intestinal and urinary cystosomiasis. So the clinical development plan of our presequentel included two phase one studies to evaluate the bioavailability of the compound versus the racemic presequentel, as well as the other, another formulation which was already presented by Daniel. Uh, and both studies were performed in South Africa. Um, a phase two study, dose range in study in Côte d'Ivoire in children three months to six years with cystosoma Manson eye infection, uh, showed that arpra at a dose of 50 milligram per kilogram was efficacious and safe, as well as comparable to Biltrizide, which is the reference internal control arm we included in this study. In addition, before the phase two, we performed a, stu an, um, a palatability study, an acceptability study in Tanzania. Estudo de palatabilidade e aceitabilidade de crianças para diferenciar as informações. E nós decidimos ir com study was used for the phase three confirmatory confirmatory pivotal trial that was performed in Kenya and Côte d'Ivoire, recruiting children with both species infection, as Mansonai, which is responsible for intestinal cystosomiasis, and cystosoma hematobium, which is responsible for urinary cystosomiasis, and another relevant entity, female genital cystosomiasis. Akbi, uh, uh, Akba, yes. excuse me. Uh, yes. are you, do you have a PowerPoint uh, presentation to share? We can't Sorry? see yet your presentation. You cannot see it? No. Sorry. Sorry for Let me share again. your presentation. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you still see it? Yeah, it's perfect. Excellent. Thank you and sorry for <laughs> no worries. Technical issues always happen. Yeah. So, yeah, th that's basically the comprehensive clinical development program that I already explained. Um, it's basically the most relevant thing is the phase two and phase three study results. We did some phase one study for evaluate the bioavailability of the different formulation as well as a taste study. Uh, for the ODT assessment in terms of acceptability and palatability. So the pivotal study design that was agreed with IMA before running the phase three study consists basically on three cohorts of subject with intestinal cystosomiasis represented in the blue boxes. Um, having in the cohort one, a randomized setting to two treatments group consisting of Arprazequantel or Biltrizide. As you can see, the randomization was two to one uh, in order to have additional safety data for our product. Um, and we included another two cohorts according to the different age groups, which is something required uh, for authorities in order to evaluate the benefit risk of the product across the different pediatric groups. Cohort two included subjects two to three years old, and cohort three included subjects three months to 24 months. This cohort three group, we pulled the result of this, um, uh, the, the result in terms of safety and efficacy with the phase two study selecting the subject in the same age group. In addition, we included a cohort four initially which was composed at the start of the trial by 90 subjects, 
treated with cystosomia hematodum infection treated with alprazicontel at 50 milligram per kg. But after the first interim analysis, the cure rate was not completely satisfactory for us. And we decided, and this is something that was pre-specified in the protocol to increase the dose to 60 milligram per kilogram and include another time point for the assessment at fifth week post-treatment in order to understand better the behavior of our compound um, in this population. Um, the main end point for the pivotal trial were cure rate at the third week post-treatment according to the recommendations of WHO and CDC for cystosoma mansona infections, specifying as an efficacy threshold for the trial succeed uh, to be at 70% for the lower bond of the confidence interval. That's very important because it's not the point estimate. They requested to have a lower bond of the confidence interval above 70%. Um, that was agreed due to some trials in school age children and some preschool age children. But uh, the difference is that in our trial, we had much more restrictive uh, criteria for achieving cure. So in our trial, we considered subject cured if there is no eggs detected in the follow-up visit. And follow-up visit for Mansona infected subject means two days collecting feces and sampling it in three different slides, meaning that at the end of the study, we have six slides and none of them should have eggs in the follow-up. While for the hematobium infected subjects, we collected during three different days, urine, and after filtering it, we evaluated if there are eggs. So cure mean no eggs in none of those uh, three um, samples. A secondary endpoint, we included clinical cure at third and fifth week post-treatment. The fifth week was selected only for the hematobium species. Um, and in addition to egg reduction rate, safety assessment and acceptability uh, slash palatability. It's important to rem remind everyone that for WHO, the most relevant endpoint is egg reduction rate because it's the only one that demonstrated correlation with the morbidity control in the real world settings. So uh, the decision to include as primary clinical cure was because EMA usually, well, not usually always request for infectious diseases to evaluate the cure. Uh, but anyway, achieving cure in the subject with a very high reduction rate will not provide additional benefits um, in terms of morbidity control. That's an, a relevant point. The main inclusion criteria were having an age between three months to six years. And when we say to six years, it means six years, 11 months, that's the limit. In addition to having an infection by cystosoma manzoni or cystosoma hematobium, excluding mixed infections, um, in addition to have a minimum body weight of five kilograms and of as usual in clinical research setting for pediatric population having parental consent. Uh, we excluded subject with conditions such as seizures because um, that could be an indication of neurocysticercosis that uh, should not be treated with praziquantel before, before being pretreated with corticosteroids. It's a very severe condition that should be managed carefully. In addition to excluding subject with debilitating illnesses, um, to avoid the, the issue of immunocompromised subjects that could not respond appropriately to prosequential treatment. In addition to an exclusion to use antimalarials two weeks before screening. And the reason for that is that antimalarials some of them has a very potent effect against cystosoma, um, mansonite and hematobium both. Uh, so it can bias the results in our uh, study. Um, in addition, we excluded subjects and we included as prohibited medications some pr products that might interfere with the praziquantel metabolism. So in the disposition chart, as you can see, 
we pre-screened almost 2,700 subjects in both countries facing sometimes extreme difficulties in the access to remote villages. Remember, this is a disease that is usually found in rural areas, not in, in the urban areas, not in the cities. So for finding the, the study population, you have to, to get access. And we had a lot of floods in the area. Um, so it, it was really a challenge for the research team. A total finally of 326 subjects were screened and 288 were enrolled. From them, we excluded due to the use of anti-malarial H subjects and the MITT, which is the modified intention to treat population that we used for the efficacy assessment was composed of 280 subjects, thanks to the great work uh, during the follow-up of the study sites personnel. Looking at the demographics and the MITT population, it's important to mention that for cohort one, it was agreed with EMA uh, to have at least 40% uh, of our population um, with moderate or heavy infection in order to evaluate the behavior of the product and they're both subpopulation, light infected and heavily infected. Uh, but in general, across the different cohorts, the infection intensity, severity was a reflect of the epidemiology of the disease in Sub-Saharan Africa, excepting for cohort two, in which we have almost 60% of the population heavily infected. And the reason is because we recruited the subjects in areas with hot spots. Um, the anthropometric measurements were consistent with the age groups of the population recruited uh, across the different cohorts. So here, regarding our primary endpoint, you can see that the dotted line is the minimum threshold for the lower bond of the different confidence interval. In the green bars, you can see the Esmansona infected subjects across the different cohorts, while in the blue ones, you have cohort four, which are the S hematobium infected subjects. Uh, so I will start comparing in the cohort one, the outcomes for cure rate, uh, comparing l prasiquantel r prasiquantel and Biltrizide, as you can see, quite comparable results. We met the primary endpoint criteria because the lower bond was above the 70% threshold. Um, in general, for Manson infected subjects, the cure rate was very close to 90% or even above in some subset of groups. And for built reside, please consider that they, in this group, we had only 50 subjects versus 100 in cohort 1A. That's the reason why the comparator built reside was not achieving the EMA criteria, but probably including additional subjects, they will, will, will have a similar um, outcome. So quite comparable results. Regarding the hematobium infected subjects, uh, in the first interim analysis, we achieved a 59% um, cure rate. Um, it was not completely satisfactory instead of having a net reduction rate very high, above 95%. So we decided, remember, to increase the dose to 60 milligram per kilogram. Um, and at the same week, third week post-treatment, then we achieved 86% of cure rate. Another interesting outcome is that when we delay the assessment two weeks later at the fifth week post-treatment, cure rate tend to be higher, meaning that in research setting, probably for hematobium species, we need to have a delayed assessment to evaluate completely the response to praziquantel or r praziquantel in this case. At the end, we have here the mixed analysis, the pooled analysis of the subjects uh, in cohort three, as well as the very young children included in the phase two study. As you can see, the point estimate is very close, 95 versus 94%. So quite consistent result, not only within this study, but even compared with the phase two study. Here, you can see that across the different groups and cohorts, irrespectively of the species or the age group, we obtained very high reduction rate, around 99%, with 
which predict an excellent control of the morbidities in the short and the long term. In the short term, that will be relevant for anemia, for um, development impairment, cognitive impairment prevention. And in the long term, that will prevent um, cirrhosis, bladder cancer, and female genital cystosomiasis. So this is a very strong and relevant outcome for uh, the population. Just a reminder for WHO, the minimum for egg reduction rate in cystosomiasis should be nine, above 90%. So we are meeting this criteria in addition to the, to the other one required by EMA. In general, regarding the safety, the treatment emergent adverse events were more frequent in the s i cohorts. Uh, and the same trend was maintained in the IMP-related ad, uh, emergent adverse event. None of the IMP-related um, events were serious. We didn't have any death nor discontinuation due to adverse events. And we had only one subject with severe adverse event related to the IMP in cohort two, being a severe abdominal pain that was resolved 24 hours after dosing without sequels. In general, as you can see, quite comparable outcomes uh, across the uh, s groups and very low uh, uh, percentage incidence of adverse event in cohort 4A and 4B. In, in line with the praziquantel safety profile, the IMP-related adverse events were mainly gastrointestinal, incomparable trends between our praziquantel and Biltrizide, as you can see, uh, looking at cohort 1A and 1B. Um, it's important to highlight that in cohort 2, we had higher percentage of gastrointestinal adverse event, but the reason is because we had much more higher percentage of subjects heavily infected uh, that usually after being treated, our plasiquantel induce a massive parasite killing and that parasite killing induce an in inflammatory response in the bowel that produce vomiting and diarrhea uh, and that produce hydroelectrolytic this balance and that explain why we have higher percentage of somnolence in this cohort also. Uh, regarding hematobium, just to say that there is a tendency to lower incidence of adverse event as expected and reported by literature for praziquantel. For the palatability score uh, assessment, our praziquantel showed across the different cohorts an improved palatability score in which higher scores means better palatability compared to the Biltricide group. Important to mention that we evaluated uh, palatability in subject five to six years old, because they, they are usually the better reporters for this kind of assessment. The key conclusions can be summarized in a favorable profile in terms of efficacy and safety for both species at 50 and 60 milligram per kilogram that the study met the primary endpoint with a lower bond of the 95% confidence interval above the 70% with cure rates very close to 90%. The product achieved in addition, an excellent egg reduction rate across the different cohort predicting a great morbidity control. The study didn't show any new potential safety risk and the palatability of our praziquantel was improved through this new uh, formulation compared with um, the regular praziquantel. And finally, I cannot close the presentation without giving big thanks to all our consortium partner, to the clinical trial staff that did the impossible to complete this trial instead of COVID, our investigators because they continuously supported us and provided insights, and the most important to the stakeholders that are the children and parents that participated and made possible this successful trial. With that, over to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Akba. Thank you. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Uh, so now we will, we will open for questions. So if we have done uh, it yet, please write your question at the chat so we can read it for, for our guests. 
So I'd like to, to invite our guests to, to open your camera. And now we can, we can start our, our discussion and our questions. So once again, thank you all of you for, for, for giving us uh, this, this, this presentation for this, this nice afternoon that we are having today. Afternoon in Brazil, not there in Europe, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's start, some, let me see if we have questions. We have, we have one question for Daniel, but before this, uh, I have one question for Yuta. So uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very practical and, and, and objective question. So uh, from, from what I understood, uh, the consortium proposal is to prioritize uh, vulnerable populations and, and country, countries with less technological and financial capacity. And so my question is, how, how is this new formulation intended to be distributed around the world? Uh, I mean, how, who will you pay for, for the drugs and, yeah. and <laughs> practical yes. questions? <laughs> yes, that, that it is a very practical and a very important question because what is very clear is that those patients cannot pay for, for the treatment, even if, you know, Praziquantel is, is, is a cheap product. Mm -hmm. And also the pediatric Prasiquantel is, is not an expensive treatment, but still the, these young patients and their families in Africa, they, they cannot pay for it. So what we are doing now already in advance of the registration of the product is uh, setting up a, a network of funders um, that would be interested to buy the product. I, I give you an example, but that's not confirmed. UNICEF is an organization that is buying um, treatment and especially vaccines for, for, for children. Um, other organizations, um, can, there are countries where the uh, development agencies are interested to support uh, individual African countries. So what is lacking for neglected tropical diseases is a global fund. We, we mm -hmm. do not this. We have a global fund for malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. What we are advocating for is that, that organizations come together, pool their funding, and buy uh, this product because this will give a signal to, to other development um, partnerships that there is a path um, and that you are not dependent on one single donor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so. Not, not a solution as of today, but we fully we are fully aware of <laughs> of this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's it's a good way to 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 poor countries have ensure that they are gonna have this this yes, this pills. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And we think it's sustainable for the future. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. sustainable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, if, if Okba or Daniel wants to, to, to say, uh, to complement the, 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 the answer of Juta, just feel free to open your microphone and, and talk. It was just perfect reply. Okay. Uh, Daniel, we have uh, one question here in our chat. Uh, it's a question in Portuguese, so I'm going to read this in, in Portuguese. Uh, yeah. Você está vendo aí, Daniel, a pergunta? É que eu leia? Eu, 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 eu acho que eu entendi. Vamos ver. Leia, leia para a gente aí. I believe, I believe I was able to understand. Good afternoon. Uh, the question was asked by Gabriela Parreiras. Good afternoon. I didn't understand how the Praziquantel pediatric or the pediatric Praziquantel can be a racemic mixture uh, since Praziquantel is already traded. And so having a smaller uh, tablet and uh, having a smaller problem was going to give us a problem. I believe that this is related to a question that was already asked me. It has 600 milligrams. The one that is treated and traded it has 600 milligrams of racemic prasipotel. 
the pediatric dose is related to the children's weight. And if you do calculations, and butricide is subdivided into four parts, going to be 150 milligrams is the most reasonable value. If I'm going to develop a smaller product, what is the amount that I can have? Of course, you can have other quantities. This decision is not right or wrong. We decided to use 150 milligrams. That is one fourth of the butricide. So if it is a racemic mixture, why shouldn't the the Praziquantel for adults be 1,500 milligrams, okay, or 750 milligrams. So at the beginning, we decided 150 milligrams because we still had to define 150 milligrams would still be a very interesting multiple number so that we could count the, the tablets. And maybe it could be 20 tablets, 30 tablets, if we only use 75 milligrams, for instance. And then in the future, we could adjust, but this was not necessary. I don't know if I was clear enough. I don't know if I answered your question. And it is there is no right or wrong, okay? So whatever is the most appropriate or adequate. You are the expert here, so I believe it's clear. Daniel, eu queria aproveitar, na verdade, para retomar um pouco uh, uh, que você até falou na sua apresentação sobre a questão dos ensaios. And you even mentioned during your presentation about the clinical trials that are going to be uh, held in Brazil and taking advantage of Juta's presence and Dr. Okba's presence. In 2022, we're going to request uh, a special authorization from a visa, if I understood you correctly. And a visa was going to authorize uh, to have a clinical trial in Brazil or register the medication without a med uh, clinical trial in Brazil. We know that the Brazilian population can answer or respond differently than other populations. And the second issue is something that I wanted to discuss with Dr. Okba, the moment that we are uh, living through. So it's going to be after the pandemic and most of uh, the world population already had contact with the virus SARS-CoV-2 and it interferes in the immune system of peoples and so it makes the immune system go a little crazy and become a little unregulated and this can last a longer time so my question is are we going to have these discussions once again with the vice presidency of your cruise daniel what do you think about this? What do you think about having these discussions in Brazil and also to get closer and closer to the translation, translational uh, group? Let me answer first and then Dr. Okba can answer it because it's a more technical question. So, Ricardo, yeah, we had a, a consultation with Anvisa and we asked them what would be necessary so that we could uh, give them the brief, the dossier, the brief, and something that would be favorable and what is going to be enough. Can will we use the clinical trials that took place in Africa? Of course, a visa is going to assess this. We are never exempt from any kind of question or request regarding something else. But at first, they authorized us to use only the clinical trials from Africa. It, they were favorable in re, uh, regarding this. And having a clinical trial in Brazil, every year I present this, I update the, the translational program, and every year... Uh, so I'm here on behalf of all of my colleagues. That's why I asked you this question. So as Fio Cruz, as the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, this was an initiative that we had at the end of 2019 of having this discussion again, okay? Right after Anvisa answered our question, we had a meeting with the vice presidency and I said, if Brazil, if the scientific community, if we feel the need that we need to have a, a clinical trial here in Brazil, 
Nothing is going to stop us from having these clinical trials here. Of course, and Juta can say the consortium is going to offer us the necessary support. But since it's not a regulatory demand, we need we need to do our homework first as an organization, as an institution, because we are a self-sufficient country better than a few countries in Africa. And so maybe we can fund our own study or clinical trial. We have to create a plan to create a proposal, and then we're going to try to obtain the consortium support. And Andre Dyer from the clinical platform, uh, he received the final proposal about one month ago, and we have to have these discussions again. And so I, I was only going to discuss this with the consortium when things were a sounder. So I'm not an expert in the clinical aspects. I'm not. So I needed the experts, okay, on board so that we could design this and have a side team, a side team. Always trying not to impact the registration of this drug in Brazil. Juta Okba. I, I mean, based on this discussion regarding potential differences between parasites, schistosoma mansoni parasites in Brazil and sub-Saharan Africa, there is a study run by University of Zurich in which they tested in vitro the susceptibility and the efficacy, well, the effectiveness in killing parasites um, from Brazil or from sub-Saharan Africa. And the reality is that the effective dose 50 that kills half of the parasite or 99 that kills 99% of the parasite is quite extremely similar. So mm -hmm. in reality, from a clinical perspective, we don't see the pharmacodynamic relevancy of performing a study in Brazilian population. Now, if the question is, particularities of the Brazilian population in terms of pharmacogenomics mm -hmm. that could make differences in terms of metabolization of the product, considering we have demonstrated that the safety and efficacy is quite comparable to Biltreside, and we know very well what is the response of Praziquantani in the Brazilian population, we shouldn't expect differences, therefore, for our Praziquantani. So, I will think carefully about requesting that. And of course, this is a, totally a decision that should be taken by Ambisa, but I, I will not delay the access to this product to the, to the population that really require it. I mean, it's, it's really a very important and relevant advantage for the preschool age children for improving acceptability especially when in some areas with hotspots in which you require twice a year or yearly treatment, it's, it's important having a very good acceptability. So for our, from our perspective, there is no reason for having clinical studies, but if this is requested, we will deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Daniel told, uh, all, all annual meeting that we have here, we talk about this, this of conducting this, this uh, uh, clinical trial here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Yuta, she opened her microphone when, when yeah. Daniel was talking. Oh, no, I, I just wanted to confirm what Daniel and Okpa were saying. Uh, there is really a huge um, pressure on the consortium now to bring this pediatric Braziquantel into the registration phase and to make it accessible. Um, I think for Brazil, and we were always in such a good exchange and I think regular contact with Anvisa, um, the, the option is always there to do a clinical study, but it should not be on the critical path for, mm -hmm. for the project. Your, your second question on the SARS-CoV-2 infections and the immune system, that's an interesting one, but this is interesting for everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, I think also African uh, population has been exposed to the virus. And um, I, that, that's, a, I mean, an important question. Again, it should not be on the critical path right now, but mm -hmm. it deserves, it deserves uh, the research and, and maybe a clinical study in addition. Um, but 
absolutely a, a good question. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I asked this question because uh, last month we treated the population here in Brazil, like 200 people, uh, and we, we found uh, one severe adverse event. So, uh, indeed, it was a population that does not have the vaccine yet, the COVID vaccine. So maybe we are just uh, asking if if there is any, any association and if the presence of this pandemic uh, moment that we are experiencing, if it can, uh, if it can, it can uh, show more severe adverse events. But we don't know. It's just it's just. Uh, Questions. So this 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 results from 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 Africa was was obtained during the pandemic. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. We stopped yes. the trial in March yes. 2020, and we restarted by November 2020. So it was seven months of halting the trial. Uh, but thanks to the great team that we have on site, that they are very experienced and they are managing even the COVID situation, we were able to reduce the number of subs going to the clinic. Uh, most of the visits were performed in the village in order to avoid, you know, the risk of epidemiological spread of COVID. So, and I think we didn't have any case of COVID in the subjects that we recruited, mm -hmm. which, we, which reflect the good work of, of the teams. Good, good. And the sample size was, I'm not sure if you showed uh, the, the, the power sample, but the sample size was, was good for, for this, right? Um, we had 288 subjects enrolled and randomized, and the modified intention to treat population was 280. That was agreed with him up front. Remember, for preschool age children, this is not a low sample size. It's a very big yeah, sample right. size indeed. And for cohort three, which were the younger ones, we had to contact with him again and request some limitation in the number of subjects. But anyway, if, if you remember the confidence interval of this cohort in which we recruited 18 subjects, it was still above the 70% threshold established by EMA. So satisfactory result, and that confirms that for preschool age children, it's, there is no need to very high sample yeah. size. Yeah, you are right. I just forgot that it's pre-school pre children. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you are right. It's a great issue. So let me see if we have more questions. Daniel, uh, Gabriela agradece sua resposta. Dan Dr. Daniel, Gabriela is thanking you for your answer. Um, any, any, any guests want to say a, a, last, a last word or, or anything else? If we don't have more questions. Just to thank you for inviting us to, to present the data. Muito yes. obrigado. Muito obrigado. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really fantastic uh, to have Famanguinhos as a partner. And please, this is our last mile <laughs> to reach the finish line. Uh, we need, we need uh, the commitment and we have the commitment. Thank you so much. Well, Ricardo, é só agradecer realmente o convite, né? Well, Ricardo, I just wanted to thank you very much for the invitation. And on behalf of Farm Manguinhos, I'm here representing Farm Manguinhos. We are always at your disposal, the translational program every year. And this year I asked you, uh, are we going to have a meeting of the program? Yes or no? Because I'm always available to participate, to update the program to have discussions, to ask questions uh, to the consortium. So Farmanguinhos is at your disposal, okay? And I'm gonna follow up everything with you, mainly here in Brazil, okay? Excellent, Daniel. We acknowledge this and we thank you very, very much, okay? Because you're always sharing the advances, the results, the outcomes of the consortium. Thank you very much. I'd like again to, to thank you, thank you for sharing your 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 results uh, and thank you everyone who stayed with us uh, in this event thank you bye 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 thank you thank you bye <laughs>